Hello and welcome to Agency Office Hours for March 2024. I'm Agency Advisor Carl Sakis at Sakis & Company. Here's a preview of what we'll be discussing today in Agency Office Hours. First up, we're talking about capacity planning. We're going to do a fireside chat with our special guest, Lowry Irin from Operating.app. We're going to talk about capacity planning to help you plan for the future. Then I'll share about where things might look for the economy this year. Then Stephen in Colombia has a question about business strategy, specifically in a rapidly changing market situation. How do you prepare for the future? What can you do? We'll talk about that. And finally, John in Minnesota has a question about account management. Specifically, when you have AMs or people doing AM work, what portions of that should be billable? If you have a question that wasn't on that list and you'd like me to answer it in the future, please include it when you RSVP. Coming up in April, April 9th, we have a special event with a special guest. Stephen Boatman is a financial planner, a CFP, and also an expert on paying for college. If you're an agency owner in the U.S., bad news is that based on your pass-through profits, you are probably not going to get any financial aid if you have kids who are going to college. What do you do? Well, there are some options. I have my current article series looking at saving for college, paying less for college or other higher ed paths, and another part coming up soon about improving your college ROI. We're also going to have a live event on April 9th with Stephen Boatman, our financial expert, answering your question. So you can sign up for that on the website. And then if you have regular questions, not about paying for college, submit those questions for May 12th. All that's available at the Sakis & Company website. We'll have a link for that in chat and a link as well uh, if you're watching the video in the video description. All right, as a reminder, things are recorded, so don't share anything out loud that you don't want to become public. And let's dive in. So first up, Lowry, uh, let me go ahead and add you in here on the spotlight. Uh, there we go. All right. All right. Hello. Well, Lowry, welcome to Agency Office Hours. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. So we, we had connected somewhat recently, and uh, you know you have a particular expertise from your own experience prior to starting operating the, the software firm. Um, if you could share a little bit, uh, you know I've invited you in as a guest today, uh, if you could introduce yourself, and then let's talk about, let's dig in about capacity planning. Sure. So nice to meet you all. I'm, I'm Lauri, uh, regards from Finland, um, and good afternoon, let's say like that. Uh, formerly working at different digital agencies, uh, I come from the IT consulting domain specifically. So I'm a software developer originally. So I've been working in, in various different consultancies over the years uh, from freelancing to companies with hundreds of people. Uh, lastly, uh, at the digital agency focusing on e-commerce where I was a, was a partner, uh, joined quite early. We grew to 150 people quite quickly and uh, at some point you see your spreadsheets, you know, starting to explode, you know, yes. kind of like who's working on what and who knows what and kind of like, how, how are we using our time? And I guess we started building a tool for our own needs operating. And that's why obviously I'm focusing my days around this topic, capacity planning. Awesome. Well, th thank you for the intro and, you know, 150 people for people who are listening live or who, uh, or well, if you're listening live, I'm curious, how many people on your are on your team today? And you might include full time, part time, and if you have active contractors, uh, you know. I'm curious. Um, of course, if you're watching the video, you you can't share that, but you can just think to yourself. So, Larry, uh, here's a, a broad question, uh, and and you know, in my work as a consultant, people will ask me about capacity planning, and I've been a project manager. Uh, but, you know, capacity planning is complicated the bigger you get. It's hard when you're small because you have limited resources team-wise. Mm -hmm. But then it's also challenging as you get bigger because they're, they're new things. So here, initial question, how should people set up the capacity planning process in terms of the rhythm, who does what, and, and so on? Exactly. Well, I guess in a way... There's there's a couple of levels you need to think about in, in in capacity planning. I guess there's the there's the sort of more strategic 
strategic longer term lens what do you want to achieve you, you have to think like why why am i planning my work right why, why do we want to forecast something well, well often it's because you know you, you want to maybe have a clear view on your sort of projected utilization into the future so you know like hey maybe i need to hire a project manager instead of a strategy consultant, because you, you can see that into the future that, hey, we're going to be more underutilized or overutilized in some specific competence. Got it. On the other hand, you might kind of like want to know like where to kind of like um, where to focus on in sales, because obviously you might, mm. you might be selling something, your sales team might be onto something, hey, we're hunting these leads. And then it might be that you have some, something completely else on the bench, so to say. Yes. So kind of like having, having that mismatch is obviously match that. Yeah. Exactly. So that's a strategic level. Then obviously there's the more tactical level, which is simply like having an efficient process to kind of allocating the right people on the right projects. Kind of who who's kind of like available right now, who's available in a week. Is is there someone who has spare time to help me out with this task that I'm working on for a customer? So there's these two levels. And obviously highly dependent on your type of consultancy or agency you're working in, like how to set up this process. Well, it can be that, you know, like most optimally, I think that every person should be somewhat accountable and sort of responsible for their own use of time, right? Mm. So you know best what you're going to do within your projects in the coming days. It's not, it's hard for a COO to know exactly what the single consultant might do. So optimally, I think that kind of planning ahead should be a collaborative process for the whole company. Got it. It's uh, not falling just to the operations head or operations team. Everyone needs to be part of it. Maybe the operations team is overseeing things, but everyone's contributing. Exactly. And how much a single individual consultant or expert might be contributing is obviously, again, it's it's a cultural thing in, in your corporate co company culture. So in a way, um, I've, I come from this sort of like Nordic landscape with sort of a lot of flat organizations, you know, people mm. kind of like being very autonomous. So yeah. obviously that's kind of like, uh, we we always kind of like made our own capacity forecasts. Then mm -hmm. we, and on the account level, we discussed them. Uh, and then on the company level, we sort of like gathered the forecast bottom up. Obviously there was someone always scrutinizing over that, but okay. you know, that's how, that's how we delivered it. Many of our customers have, on the other hand, their team leads handling, the resource forecasting and then they discuss it they have the consultants have visibility to it and they can have a say but obviously then someone's actually literally like editing them in some sort of a spreadsheet or an app like operating that makes sense and that, you know a note for everyone who's listening or if you're watching the recording you know if your team leads managers others are involved in in capacity planning consider dialing back their own billable targets because they need to spend time doing it uh, don't do like what a friend experienced as a defense contractor where he managed seven people and he had a yet he had a personal billable goal of 40 hours a week, which meant he would work 65 hours a week. So do do consider. But of course, the more you can automate about the process, in theory, the less time it'll take and you get better, better results. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, we talked a bit about who does what. Either people are self-managing or team leads or the CEO are involved in overseeing it. Uh, you know, at, at what level should you forecast? You know, yeah. is it daily, weekly, monthly? What what is what what are your thoughts? Yeah. I personally think that for like some 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 agencies do it like too on a too detailed level so that it becomes busy work. So kind of like you're mm -hmm. really like trying to kind of like patch hours of like today. I'm going to be working on this, this, and that, and then tomorrow, this, this, and that. And they're trying to make a really detailed plan for the whole week. And obviously, you know, how things mm -hmm. are in this line of business, uh, you know, timelines shift and clients say that yeah, that's not going to happen. And yes. so I'm thinking that the project teams should have kind of like an overview on what's happening on a project within a project. And that's not maybe part of the capacity planning process that's happening on a project portfolio level. So right. my recommendation usually is like, obviously, sometimes you have to log that, hey, I'm going to be off. I have a you know, paid PTO next Friday. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's day specific. But mostly we recommend our customers to do it on a weekly level. For some, even with highly predictable projects, like on a monthly level. And then what's important is once you start 
looping the actual hours back in, which we can maybe talk a bit a bit later on. So kind of like how do you actually compare then the actual hours yes. plans that you're making? The, that makes sense. So sort of insights there. Um, I know that I, at a previous agency where I was a project manager, um, I was initially the, the one project manager, eventually we had a second. At some point in the past at the agency, they had three PMs and they used mm -hmm. Microsoft Project. I don't know if anyone is mm -hmm. still using that today, but they were using a resource pool feature. And apparently the capacity planning was very good, but that was because one of the three PMs spent 20 hours a week updating yeah. all of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, from, from your perspective, what are your thoughts on the ROI of like, you want it to be accurate, but as you said, if you're focusing grain, too granular, granularly, uh, that's not a good use of time. I, you know, do you have any kind of a metric on how much time people should spend on capacity planning? Not any exact metric, but I, I think that it should really happen. If it happens on an individual level, like a like a consultant updates their plans, it shouldn't take more than a few minutes per week, to be honest, okay. to do the, your own plan. Obviously, if you're making, you know, you're, you're leading a team of 20 people, it might take, you know, three minutes times three, at uh, like times 20, and then some yeah. discussions with people. But if you think on an individual level, it shouldn't really take that much time. I think the most important part is, again, the discussions that happen kind of like when you know, kind of like uh, you, for example, you look the actual hours back in and you see that there's some deviation from the plan that, hey, we made a plan, mm -hmm. but actually I'm spending more or less time. So that's where the kind of like you then start to figure out, like actually our planning is on a too high level. We can't get any meaningful insights from this. So that's you. Just, like, I would I would start from kind of higher level and go de de more, to a more detailed and detailed level mm -hmm instead of like really going for a really fine, fine grain level of planning. So trying to find that balance for kind of like a very consultancy like answer, but there's always a balance yeah. that you need in there. That, that, that makes sense. I, I had a client yeah. uh, reach out a few years ago and they said that, you know, that they, they weren't profitable enough. The owner was overworked. By the way, they were going over budget 50 to 80% uh, yeah. most of the time. And one of their questions later in the engagement was, well, what is our exact labor cost per hour? And and I exactly. said, that's important, but stop going over budget 50 to 80% first. Fix Absolutely. that first, then let's worry about the labor costs. Exactly. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think many agencies should be like, like have this process somewhat set up and focus on sales, focus on delivering like great client work. So I think all of this should be actually quite, it's, it's, um, bit paradoxical as I'm as I have software for it but yeah if, if people spend the least amount of time sort of like bragging lines and sort of figuring out when to do the work and actually right. would focus on delivering value and sales then I think that's that's what people like agencies should be spending their time on that makes sense a question for everyone who's joining live uh, go ahead and share in chat I how do you approach planning a capacity planning in your agency feel feel free to to share uh, so, Larry, you, you know, let, let's dig deeper on insights. You know, you mentioned getting insights to to make better decisions. You know, you noted strategically that includes hiring and so on. But uh, let's talk more about that. It, how do you how can you draw insights from the process for hiring, sales, balancing resource allocation, so on? Yeah, I think I think hiring and sales are kind of somewhat very very linked. So it's kind of like you, you draw the insights in a very similar way. So first of all, I think in whether if you're growing like you're 20, 30, 40, 50 people, like you start to grow your agency and, and then you get all these different competencies and skill yes. sets within the company. It's important that like obviously to have like these, these are our sort of like cost centers. You have them set mm -hmm. up so you can filter the system with those. And then you have your roles like project managers, developers, or designers, and whichever competencies you might have in, in your your company, like clearly set up in the system. So it's easy to kind of like derive insights based on competence, because obviously on an aggregate level, you can only kind of like say that, hey, we made this much, we're, we're gonna be this utilized, but you, you can't really make any meaningful decisions based on that. But when you get on a competence level, like, hey, looks like our React developers or our Google Ads experts will be 140% utilized three mm -hmm. weeks from now. That's probably gonna be uh, an issue, so you can, make any hiring decisions yet like uh, anymore because it's three weeks from now but perhaps you can find a freelancer right. contractor to do the work 
help help with the team. And so that's kind of like uh, getting a competence level insight to the capacity weeks and months ahead. And obviously it can be only so accurate because as we know, timelines, you know, plans change and so on. But, you know, that that's the sort of hiring lens. I, I like the idea of focusing on on competent uh, competence competency. I know when yeah. we did the demo of, of operating recently, you know, you have it set up where you can tag people accordingly. Like at one point when I was doing resource management, I had a coworker who was a visual designer and also sort of a UI designer and also a front end developer, mm -hmm. and she far preferred UI design. But her comment was she needs to be able to do front end development because that's going to have more career demand in the future, you know, for her at the time. Yeah. But it was nice to know that I could assign her to do either one. Uh, you know, so I, I I like that there's a way to incorporate people can do more than one thing and you can assign exactly. them accordingly. Yeah. And you know, it's it's like these sort of like when, when your company grows, it's it's tough kind of like always like remembering what people can do. So it's nice if there's yes. a place for people to like give like voice out what they would like to do what they can do so kind of like the skill management side is obviously it gets more important once your company grows uh, right. you know people when you're 10 you know 15 it's it's easy to have that discussion but when there's more than that and um, people might feel that their their sort of their skill set is not taken into consideration when making those sort of resource allocation decisions so if those are somewhere somewhere present in the system where the staffing decisions are sort of discussed and handled, then that will always yes. help. That's yeah. a great point. And uh, we have some good comments coming in on chat. Uh, you know, so I had asked, how do you approach capacity planning? So Chris, thank you for sharing. Mentioned expecting each department to, department to do a certain percentage of the work. We establish capacity and utilization rate for each team based on that. We look at sales pipeline to project new demand and then see how department capacity changes with that new work coming in and then hire accordingly. That makes a lot of sense. and. And uh, Chris, I see you say you've automated all of this using Google Sheets, Data Studio, API tools. Uh, you are, I think, ahead of most agencies around automating that internally. Uh, so kudos. Uh, John, I see you shared uh, it's currently a rock. So like an EOS rock for you to improve on. Totally makes sense. Right now it's manual with, with the spreadsheet and then you review projected hours and pipeline. Uh, right now, one of the challenges is on CRM and incoming work data and the fidelity of utilization. Um, you mentioned that the main report is monthly, smaller weekly touch points. I mean, it sounds like a good balance, right? Focusing monthly, but you need the info. I know as a PM, I would, at a time in materials agency for one of the roles, uh, part of my job every Friday was to review everyone's timesheet entries because those were going to get mm -hmm. all rebuilt mm -hmm. the client making sure was everything that's billable marked as billable? Was it rounded up to the next quarter hour? Was it this, was it that? And that made it a lot easier at month end. Exactly. For that specific thing, like we, like we, I talk a lot about uh, the sort of planned versus actual hours in a way. So we're like, if, if there's, if you can automate that, what you do, what you did every week, if you can somehow kind of like, this is the plan, this is the budget, yes. this is the actuals, instead of like pulling the stuff manually from different, different systems into one, it's, that's going to be like a real, real time saver. Uh, so definitely what, what you did is exactly what, what I've been doing too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, uh, though, though, hopefully, you know, without as you know, you mentioned the exploding spreadsheets, uh, hopefully w without that. Uh, it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Chris has found a good solution. Um, sure. So, I, you know, one more question comes to mind. Um, we talked a bit about team members getting them enlisted. I'm a big fan of incentives, right? People tend mm -hmm. to do things they have the incentive to do. What are your thoughts on incentivizing? How do you incentivize people to participate in capacity planning when they've already got a million things to do? Yeah, I think the you know, strongest incentives are always monetary incentives, mm -hmm. like surprise surprise in a way so yeah I've, I've seen that you know because you're you're an employee in a company right so you might it's just like to be honest it might not be that interesting to you like how the you know company as a whole and so let's face it you know a single employee might not think that's really interesting how the company right. is going to be utilized two months from now so but obviously first of all you need to explain like the qualitative thing is you need to explain why it's done so obviously it's to make better decisions so that that person can have the right colleague at the right time helping them 
when they get kind of like a crunch in a project or when they get overburdened with work. Uh, we're trying to obviously sort of like minimize those sort of situations. So explaining why it's done. So it's a lot about communication. Uh, so it's not kind of like that qualitative incentivization. But other than that, it's the sort of monetary side. So I think like, to be honest, profit sharing in a way, if, if you share a part of your profits with with your with your employees, there's some, yeah. some sort of a, it can be profit sharing or sort of like a equity-based incentivization. But suddenly, right. you know, companies with, you know, consultants who have equity are interested, you know, in planning the future of the company too. So it comes without saying. Yeah. One specific ways, I think it's like, I, I've heard of like uh, setting up kind of like uh, these setups where if you bring in a lead to the system, you get X percent of the revenue that will kind of come through that engagement. And if you help in closing that, you get another X percent. Mm. So kind of like, also that's very specific, but there are yeah. kind of creative ways you can work in incentivizing because, you know, I, I consider bringing new leads into the system with, mm -hmm. with uh, capacity forecasting or capacity planning. I think that's precisely what it is too. Th that that makes sense. And, uh, you know, I just shared a link in chat if you're on live uh, about helping people adopt more of an ownership mindset. Uh, also speaking of incentives, there's a classic article uh, about an agency where if you didn't submit your timesheets, mm -hmm. you did not have access to the office beer dispenser on Fridays. <laughs> That's up to That's you. Great. Obviously, that <clears throat> probably isn't going to work remotely, and maybe not everyone's going to be drinking the beer, but there we go. Well, you know, Larry, thank you so much for, for joining. I appreciate your being here as a guest. Um, if people want to learn more, uh, you, what, what, what should they what should they do? Well, obviously, I I work with this topic daily. So connecting with me on LinkedIn, I'll share my profile. I'll, I'll share my email. You can you can send me send me an email, send me a LinkedIn awesome. message. Let's catch up. Obviously, our website too has has a lot of topics. I guess your website most likely also has, as you linked already, quite relevant topics. So I think yep. there's a gazillion places to learn about this. But I as I'm here, I obviously recommend to contact me to discuss this. Sure. Well, and and. You know, I love the the tagline you have at the website operating dot app. The missing link between sales and project delivery, something that yeah. a lot of agencies really really could use. Exactly. Hey, thanks, Carl, for having me. Larry, uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Coming up shortly, we'll have questions from Stephen and John. Uh, questions about how do you prepare your agency for the future in a rapidly evolving evolving market. Uh, and what about billing for account management? Should you? Yes. And for what? We'll talk about that shortly. But first, today's event is sponsored by Sakis and Company. Hey, Carl Sakis here, helping you grow your agency profitably this year and beyond, helping owners work less and earn more while creating opportunities to reward your best team members. We were just talking about incentives. If the owner is working less, the team, well, will be stepping in to do some of what the owner used to do, which means promotion opportunities for team members along the way. What will happen in the economy in 2024? No one knows for sure, but the indicators are promising. Lower inflation, lower interest rates, more hiring. If that keeps up, it means your clients will spend more money at some point in 2024. But more client spending means it's going to be more competitive, right? If there's more money budget-wise out there, more agencies are going to be focusing on the same markets. Is your agency ready to handle the new work and the fierce competition? There are implications on this for services, for staffing, for sales process, and more. It helps to get a checkup before you really need everything to work. I recently scheduled with my HVAC company a spring tune-up where they're going to come out. It's part of a pre-paid pre -paid plan uh, where they'll confirm that everything is on track, everything is working before it gets extremely hot and I really need the air conditioning to work. It's uh, good to plan ahead. Would you like that for your agency? Well, do my phase one consulting service. You'll get advice, accountability, and validation and you'll get custom advice in about a month. 
You can learn more at my website, sakusandcompany.com. We've shared the link in chat and in the video description. All right, coming up next, we have a question from Stephen. Stephen, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and welcome hello, to hello. Agency Office Harris. Hello. So uh, you're joining us from Columbia today. Thank you. Uh, let me restate your question and then if you could share a bit more and then we'll we'll dig in on answering that. Sure. You asked a question about business strategy. Specifically, how should we build our agency for tomorrow with all of the disruptive innovations like generative AI, market trends, and so on? If you could, please elaborate a bit and then we'll dig in. Sure, sure. Hi, everyone. Steve Rodriguez. Um, so I've been in the marketing industry for, what, three or four years. I've been doing sporadic individual client projects and contracts in the past few years. And as I explore more of an agency model, to kind of scale my operations a bit, I keep having some doubts. Um, there's a bunch of disruptive tools hitting the market, like you mentioned, generative AI, changing industry trends and landscape and so on. There's no shortage. And there's no shortage of shovel sellers out there in the market saying things like, the marketing agency is dead, start an AI marketing agency instead, and so on. Yeah. Um, so I'm feeling a bit of what, analysis paralysis and looking for some guidance on how to launch and build an agency for tomorrow. Yes, uh, it's smart to be thinking about that. So let, let, let's dig in. Given the rapid changes in the market, how do you create the agency for tomorrow? We don't know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow, but here's some things to keep in mind. Consider that if you as an agency, and this is, you know, I mean, you every, for everyone who's listening, if you're struggling to keep up, that's also true for your clients. And unlike your agency, your clients don't have time to keep up with every single key trend. Uh, they may be struggling to even know which are the key trends versus things that aren't as applicable. Um, for instance, I, I had a dentist client once, I was director of client services. This was back when the .xxx domain extension came out and he was worried that someone would create an adult website for his domain name and would like siphon off traffic or something like that. And I, I, I explained, you know, sort of th that was, thanks for reaching out. I'm glad he asked us for advice rather than just getting the domain. Uh, and I explained sort of what it would take for people to exploit that. And that it was probably not going to happen to, you know, ABC dentistry dot XXX. I said, but if you want to, you can get the domain or we can help you with that and redirect it and, and it'll be fine. He decided not to move forward, but that was a case where, you know, he was reactively reaching out a, a, about something. So, you know, your clients don't have your agency's breadth of industry and, and, and client experience. They aren't doing what you do all day long. So that means that the work you're doing to stay ahead, you're probably still gonna be ahead of most of your clients. I would also look for ways to focus on their needs first. What are their big challenges and how can you help? And that also includes finding others to help as well. For instance, in our special office hours next month, April 9th, I'm bringing in a financial planner to talk about the topic where I've been doing the article series on paying for college as an agency owner, um, but I'm not a financial planner. So I am hosting a financial planner to answer people's questions because that's what he does all day long. Uh, so it's okay to bring in others. And you know, for the, the agency version, that could include, uh, are there partner firms or are there partner contractors, freelancers, others that you could bring in to help with things? That's something to consider. Another piece is to decide how you'll keep up. You or your entire team or somewhere in between, um, you know, maybe it's something as the owner you're leading, keeping up with what's going on. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, consider Will Reynolds at Seer Interactive. Yes, he founded the agency, but part of his title includes being the head of innovation because he's hired others to help run the day to day so that he can be the face of the agency and also focus on innovating. Uh, that's good to have space like that. It's not easy to make that necessarily your full-time role, but any bit of time you can. 
An alternative is to spread that out across the team so that everyone's doing some degree of work about keeping up and what's next and then running test engagements to see, you know, to see what works. Um, do keep in mind that if you're testing things out, testing out new options, um, you may not want to charge full price if it's something that you've never done before and you're not confident about how it'll go. You have the option, though, don't make it totally free. Make it what I would call strategically free or strategically discounted. That means you tell the client, hey, there's this emerging technology. We're trying it out. Would you like to be one of the first clients to experience our work on this? You'll be ahead of everyone else, and we'll do it at half off for the, the first month or you know some sort of discount where you're telling the client they're getting a limited term discount for a, you know, a, a period of time, and then the price would go up to full price if they want to continue. And you might also frame it as they pre-agree to give you a testimonial, uh, if not a full case study, based on their experience uh, kind of thing. That would be strategically discounted or strategically free. Those are good. Don't make it secretly free. Now, you know, part of keeping up on client industry challenges means knowing their industries. This is one of the reasons I'm a fan of focusing on an industry or multiple industries uh, rather than every possibility within your agency. Uh, for instance, with the dentist client, uh, I would subscribe to things like the dental economics email newsletter to hear about trends in running a dental practice and what's going on. And the interesting thing was that a lot of the articles they had about marketing were like three to six months behind kind of general marketing, uh, because, you know, in, in that case, the industry wasn't quite as advanced, although, although the client I had was fairly sophisticated overall uh, in terms of marketing and lead gen. Their comment was, get them in the chair, we'll, we'll take it from there. They, they also, when I talked about lifetime customer value, I, I introduced the concept and they were like, they were like four thousand dollars, and that's in the first four to five years. After that, we have maxed out their mouth. It was a little terrifying to hear a dentist talking about maxing out your mouth, but I mean, it made sense. Whatever they could sell you and upsell you, it was done in the first four to five years. Um, there's also, uh, I think, pizza today. Like if you focus on pizza restaurants, uh, there, there's something for everyone. So, Stephen, what is your reaction so far on on all of that? I think lots of lots of interesting things. I know on on my industry niche, or at least I haven't thought of, of that just yet. I know that I've been focusing on one thing and I'm a HubSpot solutions provider. So I love anything related to HubSpot and finding those clients that are interested in getting into HubSpot so I can focus on that. And everything else is a bunch of SOPs. Um, but I, I think where I'm getting stuck at, I know, let's say for example, the basic is my team, or at least me and the contractors I have, we focus on at least being AI friendly. So we leverage chat okay. GPT and other things to mm -hmm. do some work and refine ourselves before we do the outcome. But yes. how do I translate that to now the clients or how, how would you recommend or what ideas do you think we should consider there? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, a few pieces to consider there. You mentioned with your focus on HubSpot, you know, one of the big trends in the industry is around cookie-less, the cookie-less future, where companies that were relying on cookies to target ads don't have the same options to do that as they have in the past. And I, I realize that's sort of still in, in flux, but that's a good reason for people to build their own list and to build a segmented list and to be able to target their list directly. Because if someone has raised their hand and opted in and ideally shared a bit more so you can enhance their record, uh, you're able to address and the client is able to address them in the way that they can't anymore through cookie-based ad serving alone. Um, so that might be a case where you do some content about, you know, did you know cookies are going away? Uh, it creates these problems for you, but we've got a solution. So that way, you know, HubSpot, or I mean, obviously it could be any marketing automation system, though HubSpot has a lot of features. Um, you know, we've got a solution for you. Um, you know, in terms of generative AI, uh, 
So the Bureau of Digital has had a couple AI and your agency workshops uh, with agency owners and others speaking at those. I went to the one last year and they just did another one uh, earlier this month. And I, I imagine they'll probably do more, um, but it was really great, great content. Um, and, uh, you know, amidst all of that, uh, one of the themes that came up, I, I've encouraged several clients to go to it, uh, people have internal and external AI policies for how they're using AI. Uh, you know, the internal one is going to be more detailed. The external one is the client-facing version. Uh, notably, though, people are not adding that policy to their master services agreement or their statement of work. The thought there is it's still rapidly evolving. It doesn't make sense to lock it in the same way you would like your, your payment terms. So that's something to consider. How will you use AI? How will you not use AI? And, you know, what, what do clients need to know about that? Now, one consideration here is that, um, you know, as you're thinking through this, um, you know, consider how you're charging. If AI helps you get things done faster and you're billing hourly, you're losing capturing some of the value there. That is a good reason to consider switching potentially to something more milestone-based or deliverable-based rather than charging just on hours alone or you know, potentially making some other changes along the way. Um, you know, and, and also I would definitely talk with your team about this. You know, how are they feeling about the growth on AI? Uh, for instance, uh, Fiverr, you know, the freelancer sourcing platform, uh, recently did an ad campaign, and it has a photo of a person with, you know, kind of a single color background. And there's a big headline in front of the smiling person. And the big headline says, AI took my job. And then in the fine print at the bottom, it says, to the next level. So it's AI took my job to the next level. Uh, I mean, AI definitely helps in my work uh, and my team's work. Um, I don't foresee ever releasing, say, a blog post that is fully AI based. I found, you know, things like ChatGPT4 is helpful as a writing assistant or writing partner. Um, but, you know, I'm usually making making various changes, but, you know, it'll help think of things that I might not have thought of. Um, so. You know, I guess a key piece with that is, say, on generative AI, testing what's out there, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, keeping in mind privacy implications as well. Um, but I, I guess ultimately, if if the goal is how do you stay ahead, that requires making non-billable time to explore, to read about what's going on, to try stuff out on your own um, so that you're ready and you're ahead of, of, of clients. Um, and also thinking ahead, you know, I talked a bit about my phase one consulting service where I do a review of everything across the agency and flag potential opportunities, potential risks. It helps to take a look at things uh, in terms of your team, in terms of your services. One of the articles we shared in chat is around my agency services framework. The idea is that every agency service fits into one of three categories, and those are think, teach, do. Think is about strategy. Clients are like, what should I do? Teach is about training and empowerment. Clients are like, I want to do it myself. Show me how. And then finally, think, teach, do. Do is about implementation, where the client's like, do it for me. You know, in terms of where things are trending, uh, not to focus too much on, on AI, but certainly implementation-wise, there are ways to do implementation more efficiently. Um, among my clients that do SEO, there's a question around what percentage of the writing can be AI-based. Uh, I don't have a definitive answer on that, but that's definitely a trending topic. Uh, in terms of training and empowerment, uh, you know, one of the, whether you charge for it or value adds is around documentation on things. Maybe you feed things in and, uh, uh, you know, with a large look back window um, and have AI spit out what their training would be based on the inputs. Um, and then on the strategy side, 
Um, you know, I, I don't know if I trust the AI yet today in terms of gender AI, uh, although you want to try different models to see what your experience is to fully come up with the final strategy, but you could, it's a good starting point to say, what should I be thinking about? This can also be a good way as you're working on training team members uh, as strategists uh, where they can ask, so what should I be thinking about? And dig in on that rather than you having to do all the training. You still need to do some of the training. I, I'm And a question, by the way, for everyone who's joining live, uh, how are you using AI now internally or for your clients? Go ahead and share that in, in chat. So Stephen, I know we've covered a range of topics and I mean, there, there's certainly even more ahead, but thinking about how can you solve your client's problems, knowing what the problems are, how can you solve them, thinking about the think, teach, do model, about strategy, training and empowerment, and about implementation, making space to work out, to, to learn, and also to practice things. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious, Stephen, before we head over to today's final question from John, um, Stephen, what... What are your next steps from here? Um, hmm. High level, well, try to try to analyze all the all the useful nuggets that you just pointed out. Um, the teach, think, do framework or think, teach, do. Mm -hmm. I guess I haven't I haven't implemented it as much, but I find it useful. So I'm going to explore more about that. And I do have lots of aging services, so maybe kind of split it into those three categories. And then from there, seeing how I refine some of the content that I do Yes. Uh, for that. I, I did like that framework. So thank you for that. Awesome. Well, please let me know how it goes and good luck as you're working through things. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks, Stephen. All right. Our final question today is from John in Minnesota. Uh, John, if you want to unmute and come come on, uh, welcome to Agency Office Hours. Thanks, Carl. Glad to be here. Well, to let, let me uh, paraphrase your question, and if you could elaborate, and then we'll we'll dig in. So you asked about account management specifically. What should account managers do that is available? If you could elaborate, and we'll dig in. Yeah, absolutely. So you've put up a lot of you've put out a lot of good content around the account management function and billability and utilization. So I think it's a good segue. Um, we're revisiting time tracking and utilization as a whole, um, and I think it'd probably be helpful to maybe hear from you best practices around um, billable activities for account management. Knowing that yes. for us, key accountability is our client retention and revenue growth. Like that's mm -hmm. why we have it managers yep. um, and we haven't been so part of the push is just getting consistent data from that team but also understanding um what should that team be focusing on and and how how is it billable um if they're not necessarily involved in producing the work um so that also impacts utilization but also pricing as well so maybe just more best practices or some lessons learned from from your seat that got it that makes sense um and it helped frame things uh, how many total team members do you have and how many are involved in AM to one degree or another? Um, we have about 25 team members and we have three account managers and three or four project managers. Got it. Got it. Um, and overall, that, that's, you know, I'd say a typical allocation in terms of the team percentage. You could probably go a bit higher. You don't need to share how many active clients you have right now. But, you know, as your client count goes up, typically yep. people will add add more. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, you know, when it comes to AM billables, and this is true across all billables, I would say if the work wouldn't happen if you didn't have the client, then it's probably billable. For instance, uh, you know, are you going to do bank reconciliation every month, regardless of if you have someone as a client? Yes. Uh, are you going to post a blog post to help promote the agency, whether you have a client or not? Yes. But hopefully you're doing more than that to find clients. But, you know, that, that's true. On the other hand, uh, say doing a kickoff call for a particular client 
That wouldn't happen if they weren't a client. Doing an update meeting, doing a monthly report, doing specific billables uh, kind of thing. If you didn't have the client, you wouldn't be doing it. So to me, that makes it billable. Um, so that includes, and I like your focus on AM as uh, retention and account growth, that my shorthand for uh, for how I describe account management in my work less or in more book is that the AM's job is to keep the client happy and sell them more work. So yes, retention and, and upsells. Yep. Um, and of course, there are people who are doing AM without an AM title. Uh, yep. You know, a smaller agency than your headcount might have someone who's, say, a designer or a developer or a strategist, and they're also client-facing. Uh, maybe the agency owner themselves are an account manager. And the owner still could be an AM at a larger agency, say, for the biggest clients, where maybe most of your clients are paying ten or 20000 a month or 5000 a month, but then maybe you've got a client that's paying you 100000 a month and the owner is still the AM. It's probably, probably worth it in that case. Uh, but, you know keep the clients happy, sell them more work. Uh, that includes, in terms of what to bill for, that can include calls with clients, uh, other than meetings that are focused on selling new services, and uh, logging client requests to the PM system. Uh, that would also include the AM talking with the PM, if the PM has a clarifying question. In that case, the AM and the PM both should bill for that time. Uh, and, and just generally the AM meeting with the PM about, about the work. Uh, the AM doing a quality assurance review of deliverables before sending them to the client. You know, for instance, if you think one of the models in, in the, or one of the things in the restaurant model, the server's job in part is, is to confirm that the kitchen deliver the right item. Yeah. You know, for instance, say the order was, you know, substitute such an, you know, tater tots for the French fries. Yeah. Well, before they deliver it, they should double check. Is it tater tots, not French fries? Then they should fix that with the kitchen. Who I'm sure will be thrilled to hear that uh, before they deliver it to the customer. So yeah. the AM, uh, they, they may not be necessarily doing formal quality assurance, but they should make sure, you know, and review things and like, wait a minute, th this is not at all what the client is expecting, you know, kind of thing. And we, we need to figure that out. That's why ideally you're buffering things rather than finishing things, you know, immediately and planning to turn it over to the client right away. Um, so I, I have some follow-up points, but what's your reaction so far to what I've shared? I am I agree with all of that. I don't know what a utilization target for that would be yet. Uh, I'd love to so hear your thoughts. Generally, and and by the way, for everyone who's listening live, if you want to share in 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 chat, uh, how do you approach account management at your agents? So, uh, in terms of billable target for AMs, my baseline billable target is fifty percent of their time. That's fifty percent, assuming that they are working forty hours a week. So basically, billing twenty hours a week. Um, and that also assumes they're working something like 47 weeks a year, right? Because they've got PTO, their holidays, and so on. So 50% of a 40-hour week times 47. Um, and billing them at, um, you know, at least your average rate or higher if you're billing uh, on a differential yeah. rate uh, kind of thing. Now, you know, what are they doing in that 20 hours billable? The things that I mentioned about talking with clients, about working internally with the PM, double checking work, so on. What about the 20 hours that they're not billing to clients? Well, that's where upsells come in. Uh, ideally, they're also involved in the sales process for new clients. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a good idea to just throw things over the wall when a new client comes in. So yes, you probably, or you know, ideally have a dedicated salesperson or salespeople focused on the sale, but ideally the account manager who would likely be assigned to their account is going to be involved in the sales conversations, Yeah, at least at the proposal stage. No, maybe not in the very first call or if there's a second still getting a sense of things. By the time there's a proposal in play, the account manager should be involved, whether they create it or if the salesperson creates it, they need to be involved. Ideally, also the project manager is involved to, 
you know, as a PM, I sometimes would see proposals and I'm like, this is not assuming enough budget for that uh, kind of kind of thing. Uh, but the ideal would be the AM is almost like the internal project manager for the proposal. Uh, if, if the salesperson is not doing it, to pull in, make sure, do we have the inputs? Have we heard from PM? We heard from sales. What do they need to know as an AM uh, kind of thing? They're sort of double checking that the salesperson got the right info sort of deal. Um, so that's not going to be billable, uh, or at least not, not directly. Uh, the AM also should be doing professional development to keep up with clients industry. Uh, they may mm -hmm. also be meeting clients. They may be, you know, maybe they're speaking at conferences or maybe if there's an industry conference, the AM goes along with the salesperson to mm -hmm. meet up with existing clients who are at the conference. That could be a way to get upsells. Say the client has just heard about new things at the conference and the AM, their AM is right there to say, yeah, we can help you with that. Uh, help keep the client getting, uh, the existing client from getting, you know, lured away by another agency. Uh, so, you know, that's all not billable. So the primary not billables would be upsells, new sales support, and professional development about keeping up with what's going on. That might also include doing thought leadership in terms of writing uh, or creating other, other content to share what they've learned because they're in a great spot. They're hearing directly from clients about their problems. They know the language that clients use to describe their problem. Whereas if you have someone who isn't as client facing trying to do the marketing, they're not as connected to the source. So what, what's your reaction to that? Um, I love it. I it, What really sticks out is the AM being kind of an internal PM for the sales process. Yeah. Uh, we've worked to refine, uh, refine when our account managers get involved in the sales process. And right now mm -hmm. it's usually when we, when we propose an SOW and that can feel a little jarring. I right. like it of bringing it a further, a little bit further upstream to support the sales process and also probably help with some of that, that discovery at, yes. the at the proposal stage. And I also think you're looping them in earlier, but also maybe having an argument for saving greater time if it's not, mm -hmm. it's not the right opportunity. Um, yeah. So I thought that was good for an AM to take a little bit more ownership of the, that client that could potentially become theirs. Right? Yes. Okay. Well, the, the ideal, it also helps solve, uh, solve things uh, around, um, you know, I mentioned the throwing things over the wall kind of idea. And that can happen if you go from a project to a retainer, but, you know, that can also happen from sales to the account manager. You know, usually clients like the salesperson and they want to keep talking to them, but usually that's not the way you've defined the role. And yeah. so they need to like the account manager. If they've gotten to know the account manager, thanks to the salesperson's intro, the salesperson transmits their enthusiasm for the AM to the client, the client's going to feel like they're in good hands rather than you've just dumped them off to someone they've never met before kind of, kind of thing. Um, and I see a question from chat. Chris asked, if account managers are around 50% billable, what about... Uh, individual contributor specialist, for instance, an SEO specialist. So that'll vary by role. If they're a team lead, it'll be potentially a bit lower, uh, but likely your uh, specialists are going to be billing in a 40-hour week, 28 to 32 hours a week. Um, that might be less or more depending on how client-facing they are um, and if they have team lead type responsibilities. Uh, but likely they're going to be billing a big chunk of their time, uh, say 28 to 32 hours a week. Do keep in mind, if you expect someone to bill 40 hours a week, they're definitely going to have to work more than 40 to make that happen. Um, so, Chris, if you have any follow-ups on that, go ahead and share in, in chat before we wrap up. Uh, one final thing, John, to consider as, as you're sorting through this you may have people on your team, I think less so with your 25 person headcount, but for people who are listening might be smaller, although actually it applies, John, to your PMs. You may have people who are serving as deputized project managers. I, 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 that's my term for people, deputized PMs or, or AMs who aren't a full-time AM or a full-time PM, but they got to do it anyway. Yep. So my guess is that your AMs are kind of deputized PMs 
and your PMs are kind of deputized AMs. Like my guess is the PMs have some degree of client or interaction at some point. Is that is that the case? Yeah, there's intentionally some overlap all to help retain and grow the client. Yeah. Perfect. And and you know, the PM is the good backup for the AM. If the AM is on vacation or something like that, because they already know the the account, they shouldn't be invisible to, to clients. Um, but you know, if it's a situation where someone is deputized as an AM, make sure you communicate your expectations to them about what they need to get done, what they shouldn't do, um, and just generally how to navigate it. Uh, and that includes what's billable so that they're tracking it accordingly. You or one of your managers will want to provide some additional support and training as well as oversight about that because people can't read your mind. You know, if they've never been an account manager before and they don't really want to be an account manager, uh, help them, right? They're not going to magically get it. Um, you know, people who've done my agency PM 101 training, which also includes account management, you know, I talk through things about managing your clients' expectations, uh, about thinking of the iron triangle of project management, and uh, using my reason options choose technique to uh, say no when the client wants to hear yes. Reason option choose lets you do it without losing the relationship. Um, so, you know, as we wrap up today, John, what are your next steps from here? Um, probably sharing this with our um, account manager team lead. Got it. Uh, and just clarifying, like, kind of the way into buy in, like, yeah, time tracking is important and, and making sure that this feels like a reasonable target and just clarifying this with the team. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think this is going to create whiplash in terms of like new processes or approach but very much making the implicit explicit. Um, and thank you very much for sharing the target for AMs. Um, I think it's, we hear a lot about what like the people doing the work, what their target should be, right? A lot higher. Um, yes. this, this was really helpful. And I appreciate that you acknowledge the PM as well. As a former PM, I, I, I can't help myself. Sure. All right. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Well, that concludes Agency Office Hours for March 2024. I'm Carl Sakas. I hope to see you next month in April, where we have the financial expert on paying for college uh, who will share advice. You can submit questions live or beforehand. Go for that. And then we'll have the regular office hours approach, where it's all pre-submitted questions that I'm answering live in May. If you're joining us live, you'll get the recording within 24 hours. and if you were watching the recording, well, you got it already. You know, running an agency is hard. Uh, I, I don't know if running an agency will ever be easy, but it doesn't have to be so tough. If you apply the things we've discussed today and other things as well, uh, things will be a lot more straightforward, a lot less stressful, and hopefully a lot more profitable for you and your family. If you'd like help getting there, please be in touch. I'm glad to help out. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks and good luck.